of, and if everybody knew the importance of the spine with post-concussion syndrome, our offices would be filled. I mean, we wouldn't even be able to see other kinds of patients. I mean, so that's, there's a tremendous need out there. Hi there, I'm Dr. Kevin Leach here with the Chiropractic Deep Dive Podcast, bringing you the most important research and information on conservative primary spine care, upper cervical chiropractic care, and traditional chiropractic care. These research reviews, interviews, and episodes are made for you, whether you're a medical doctor, patient, or concerned family member or friend. The goal of these shows is to bring awareness of the importance of taking care of our spine and the impact it has on our health and the hundreds of different health conditions it could cause without us realizing it. I'm really trying to bring value with these, so I'd appreciate commenting on the videos, hitting the like button, and sharing them with as many people as you can. You never know who might need to see it. And consider subscribing to the channel so you can see all the other episodes and videos coming out. Thank you so, so much. I truly appreciate your support. Now on to the show. Okay, welcome back to the Upper Cervical Chiropractic Research Show. This is episode 17. I'm Dr. Kevin Leach, and I'm here once again with my good friend, Dr. Tyler Evans. How are you, sir? Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you, sir. Uh, this episode's research review is titled The Role of the Cervical Spine in Post-Concussion Syndrome by Cameron M. Marshall, Howard Vernon, John J. Letty, and Bradley A. Baldwin, published in The Physician and Sports Medicine. The goal of this paper is to bring more awareness to the role of the cervical spine dysfunction due to concomitant whiplash injury with concussion as a causative role in post-concussion syndrome. What that means is that if a person who suffers from concussion has symptoms persisting past 14 days and falls into the PCS category, there's a good chance that at the exact moment that they suffered the concussion, they also suffered a neck injury, which is ultimately contributing to their symptoms. As upper cervical chiropractors, Dr. Evans and I have seen great results with our patients diagnosed with PCS. This paper reviews the mechanisms of why we see such improvements and also other literature on this matter at the time of publishing in 2015. It also discusses the current understanding of what happens during the concussion in regards to the brain, but we're gonna stay focused on the PCS part of the paper as that is, a, that is who we are trying to reach and help uh, with this spe specific episode. The paper also has a case series of five PCS patients who underwent treatment of the cervical spine and benefits received. So we'll review that uh, probably somewhere near the end. So Dr. Evans, uh, before we go deeper into the paper, what interests you specifically about this paper? Well, a handful of things. One being the authors. Uh, John Letty is the one of the foremost researchers in post-concussion syndrome and, and, and concussions in uh, concussion research literature. Uh, he is the guy who created the Buffalo treadmill test. Uh, for those that are interested in concussion uh, work, that is, uh, that's a big deal. Uh, he's, he's a big part of that. He also has quite a few interactions with chiropractors uh, and specifically upper cervical chiropractors. So I like to follow his work. Um, I met him once at a conference. Uh, he's a tremendous guy and does really great work. Uh, and he's actually worked quite a bit with chiropractors. So um, in this paper, he actually works with Howard Vernon, who, it, who is a graduate of uh, CMCC, Canadian uh, Memorial Chiropractic College up in Canada. And I believe that's in Ontario or Toronto. Oh, geez, I feel bad now because I don't know which one, but um, that uh, is really close to where he's at in New York. And uh, so he's done quite a bit of collaboration there. And that's, you know, I, I just think it's cool that this medical doctor is doing a lot of kind of cross collaborative research. And um, I actually have a book of Howard Vernon's here um, called Upper Cervical Syndrome, and that was produced in the 80s, I think. Um, and so what's fascinating about all this is both of these guys are on a more of a, you know, more of a medical perspective. Howard Vernon's a chiropractor. 
Um, uh, Jay Letty is a, a medical doctor, but uh, we come into this from a more upper cervical uh, focused look where, you know, they're talking about the whole cervical spine, but we're really talking about the most unstable part of that cervical spine that in a whiplash or concussion type injury is getting the brunt of the trauma. And we'll talk about the forces and, and all of that more in the paper. But that's, that's why I find this interesting. I think this guy's really, both of these guys are, are on the right track. And, you know, I think if I, I got my way and we got to do some research together, we could do some really cool stuff. Uh, but that's just my thoughts. So awesome. Awesome. Um, so yeah, just for, for those out there that might not be uh, too familiar, just a, just a couple of quick statistics. Um, apparently there are 3.8 million concussions or mild traumatic brain injuries per year. Uh, that's a tremendous amount. Um, and then 10 to 15% of those become post-concussion syndrome. So 10 to 15% don't resolve after the generic 10 to 14 days of which concussions typically resolve. Um, so that's up to 570,000 post-concussion syndrome patients per year. And uh, just because I'm a geek, I did some math. That's 11,400 per state per year. Um, so that's, I mean, every single, I mean, obviously there's different populations of states, but that's, I mean, that's a tremendous amount of people that we could take care of. And if everybody knew the importance of the spine with post-concussion syndrome, our offices would be filled. I mean, we wouldn't even be able to see other kinds of patients. I mean, so that's, there's a tremendous need out there. And obviously upper cervical chiropractors aren't the only ones treating cervical spines. So, um, so that's important to understand, but it's definitely uh, what we focus on. And so, if I can add to yeah. there, Kevin, uh, it's just that, um, you know, understanding those numbers and then really taking, like, if you asked yourself how many of your patients, whether they like understand it fully or, or get it fully, and these, this, these are not every concussion gets recorded, not every mind, mild traumatic brain injury gets recorded, but I can tell you almost every single one of my patients has had some sort of head trauma, head injury over their lifetime, whether that's from birth or that's all the way through learning how to walk, to play football, to play soccer, to ballerina and dance and the whole thing, riding horses. And, and you know, it's just, we bump our heads getting up and hit the bulkhead and hit, going down into the basement. And, you know, this stuff happens to almost every single person. And you're going, you're going to find out in this paper that when you hit your head, you, you can't hit your head without hurting your neck if you hit your head hard enough, which is, you know, we'll talk about that. Right, right. Before we get into that, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. And my next point here in the medical community, they, you know, they're not really, they're not really looking at obviously, unfortunately, the, the cervical spine when it comes to post-concussion syndrome, they're looking at either something going on physiologically um, or psychologically. Uh, so what are your thoughts on, what are your thoughts on that and kind of where the state of healthcare is right now? Um, well, I would say that, um, <clears throat> you know, I think there's a, a, a big difference just in, in how we look like from a chiropractic perspective, we have a vitalistic perspective, meaning our philosophy, and I don't want to go down too much of a rabbit hole here, but everyone has a philosophy. Everyone's always projecting their philosophy on their world to understand their world better. My philosophy that I was trained in chiropractic for four years is that, you know, there are times and places where the body can heal itself. There are limitations of matter. We're taught that as well. But for a vast majority of the time, the body can heal itself. And we're taught to respect that and work with that rather than working against that, trying to treat symptoms and work on, you know, putting band-aids on uh, fire hydrants that are just flushing tons of water out of them, you know, rather than like fixing the cause. You tell somebody that's got PCS, I see it in my, the bad cases, the people that really have bad PCS, they're told that they're making it up in their head and they're crazy and they have bipolar disorders. And yeah, the DSM, I was just talking, I was just at my neurofeedback practitioner yesterday and we were talking about, it. we talk all the time about brain injury and how this is the biggest, I think it's the, one of the largest health cri healthcare crises in America, along with metabolic disease and diabetes and all that stuff. But, you know, it, 
it's it's not being taken care of and the dsm is actually creating way more problems than it's helping with and for those who don't know that's the psychiatric uh, diagno diagnostic criteria for how to bill for insurance that's what that does and what that does is that pigeonholes people they don't get results and you, you give them medication it makes it worse you put you're covering up a medical or a, a farm you're giving people pharmaceuticals you're covering up a structural problem with pharmaceutical answers that don't solve the structural root cause so anyways i'll get well, off so mind. and so the, the paper doesn't go into tremendous detail but when it says physiological versus yep. psychological when they say physiological do they you might know this because the paper didn't go into it are they talking about the continuation of the physiological problem from the concussion okay yeah, yeah. okay okay all right. Which I think a lot of times gets translated as, you know, the the brain, uh, the glut glutamate, uh, glut yeah, glutamate, and the potassium, and the, all the ion exchanges and all right. that metabolic stuff that happens. Right. Right. But what about the structure that's being injured, and how do we heal that structure? Right? right. So it's not just a biochemical reaction that's happening. There's there's structural things that are actually happening here that right. need to be addressed. So. Yeah. And for anyone interested, I always, we always recommend to just get the paper. I'll link it below um, and to read it your, yourself. If you want to look at all the ion, the, you know, all of the things that happen actually with the concussion as well and the mechanisms, it's actually pretty, it's pretty good summation in the paper here for anybody yep. interested in doing that. But again, we're focused on the PCS part. So, uh, so the next point is, you know, why does a concussion usually create a neck injury also? So like, what's the mechanism of injury? You mentioned it a little bit earlier. You can't really have a head trauma without, you know, without injuring the neck. And um, so the studies, you know, studies in the past have shown that impacts as low as 60 G's, as low as 60 G's of force can create a concussion. Um, and as low as 4.5 G's for a neck injury. So 60 verse 4.5. So since the head and neck are so close and essentially move together, it's hard to think that a force of 60 Gs, 13 times that which causes a neck injury to not cause a neck injury at the time of impact. Um, the study in the journal Brain Injury showed 100% of athletes in the study suffered, uh, that stu suffered concussion and neck injury together and that showed you know that they actually concur you know they, they actually occur at the same time any thoughts on that yeah lots of thoughts <laughs> um so <clears throat> for the last hundred and i don't want to put salt on old wounds but you know we're in a really interesting time in healthcare right now um <clears throat> i'll just say this for the last 120 years 125 years Chiropractors have argued that uh, bones misalign in the spine, and when they do, they affect physiology, um, whether that's the nervous system or the cardiovascular system or the cerebrospinal fluid system or the immune system or whatever, it affects physiology. Um, now, for the last like 30 to 40 years, we've got some consensus where a lot of people, physical therapists, uh, physiatrists, um, neurologists and, and uh, orthopedic docs are, are, are starting to agree with that and really go with that and, and recognize that, yeah, the spine does misalign and that you can correct that some with, with chiropractic. Um, and so there's a trend there that's, that's starting that's great and that's really good. Um, but my point here is that uh, you talked about the the tr the trauma levels there. You know, initially you said as low as 60 G's for a concussion. 60 G's is a ton of force. 10 G's and a pilot blacks out. Like nine G's and a pilot blacks out. Something like that. You know. So you talk about four to five G's. I mean, that's sustained, right? That's when pilots black out. And I don't want to ramble on too much here, but. Um, you talk four to five G's of force is enough to disrupt the, the soft tissue in the neck. If you look at what that looks like in a car accident or in a sports injury, that's pretty low. That's actually very low. And so you're seeing these traumas, micro traumas to the spine that are happening constantly. 
uh, that then add up over time. And then you have 60 Gs and that's huge. That's a ton of force. And of course the neck is going to misalign. There's going to be soft tissue damage that holds the neck together. And we always talk about, you and I, we always talk about stabilizing the joints rather than mobilizing, which is what a big majority of our profession talks about. But in that upper cervical spine, it moves a lot already anyways. You want to stabilize that area, make it strong, get it heal, you know, heal it so that the soft tissue, the ligaments, the tendons, and the muscles that are the glue that hold it together repair so that the nervous system can heal. Um, so think anyway. Of, yeah, I think just to interject, I think a good analogy that I use, I'm not sure if you use it for my patients when they, when they ask kind of the difference between upper cervical and traditional, this isn't about that, but right. uh, I got an analogy from someone who, who said, it's kind of like a train on the tracks. If the train's on the tracks, it's going to move smooth. But if it's a little bit off, it might be able to still go, but it's going to be a rough go. And so mm. that's kind of what we're going with the upper cervical spine. It's still able to move, but once yeah. we can get it aligned and stabilized, everything's everything's going to work better. The Obviously, the neurology, the cerebral spinal fluid, blood flow, everything. So uh, I just wanted to throw that little analogy in there. Yeah. For, yeah. Okay. Anything else on the... Uh, on the G's of force or anything as far as kind of why? No, we, nah, we okay. Okay, so the next part is, um, you know, what makes, I, and I think this is a big point because it's kind of what, it's what, I think it's what makes the diagnosis of the PCS difficult to differentiate from just a concussion in the sense that since the symptoms overlap so much, a, a it's not from concussion. Is that exactly. What you mean? Well, yeah, the yeah. PCS from concussion, Oh, like post-concussion syndrome to concussion. I mean, the symptoms overlap. It's just the, it's the, it's just a longer duration. So here's yeah. my thought process on that. It's the same. Yeah. yeah. Medical doctors, and they have a list in the paper as well, kind of like, which, you know, from the, actually, I think it's from, actually the list compares, I think, whiplash neck, to concussion. Whiplash to concussion. Yeah. Um, but I, I get, I mean, but that's kind of what we're saying, right? The whiplash is kind of the post-concussion syndrome, or at least, you know, there's some of that. But either way, here's my thought process in regards to just um, practitioners management of this problem. If they don't, they're not seeing a change of symptoms from concussion into the post-concussion. So they're not being triggered in their mind to say, oh, something else is going on. Let's do something else, a different intervention. Let's look at something else. It could be coming from somewhere else. So they're just thinking, and it goes back to the physiology and psychological part of that as far as what's going on with the symptoms. Oh, it must be psychological. It must be still physiological. They're just still suffering from the concussion. There's nothing else going on. Mm -hmm. I, did I make my point there? I think that's huge in regards to really other providers, other, other uh, medical providers not really understanding and connecting the dots of the whiplash or post-concussion syndrome with the, the concussion. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just wild when you look at that list and you compare them. Okay, so signs of concussion, headache, signs of whiplash, headache, <laughs> signs of, of concussion, neck pain, signs of whiplash, neck pain, you know, dizziness, dizziness, nausea, nausea, you know, blurred vision, blurred vision, like, you know, it just goes down the list. And these are all things that you and I, we, we work on with people all the time that may even be not necessarily related to a large whiplash or concussion injury, but they've, they've developed over time and they do resolve a lot of times under care because when you stabilize the cervical spine, all that input into the brain, it, it, it heals the, the body. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's an important piece that I think gets missed because I think you're, they're looking at this list as symptoms and which is, which is good, but they're not trying to solve the root cause necessarily. Well, the, their idea of the root cause is different. Their idea of the root cause most of the time is that there's uh, metabolic problems in the brain, whereas they're not even looking at the structure below, but that's right. where a lot of this comes from. Right, and which goes into the next point here in regards to why do they mimic each other? Um, you know, what's the, what's the mechanism of that symptom creation? And it has to do with pain-related and then proprioception-related input from the neck 
into the brain and how that affects things. And so the pain related mechanism uh, predominantly, you know, is, is for the development of, of headaches. And so the proprioceptive related mechanisms when injured predominantly develop dizziness and visual effects. And so you can have both of those symptoms, whether it's coming from the neck or whether it's happening inside the brain as well. And right. so the paper. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, if, Go ahead. If, I think you were talking about this, maybe, maybe you aren't, but th there are different types of concussions. So the, the breakdown here, maybe that's what you're talking about, but you know, there's, there's uh, oh, it's not this, this chart, but th there are charts of the different types of concussions. There's like, like a structural concussion, which is like a cervicogenic concussion, meaning you correct the neck, it gets better. So that's already diagnosed, like that's diagnosable, that's in the literature. But then there's also the, the vestibular concussion. There's also an ox, uh, what's it, ocular concussion. Um, and then there's a, other, a couple other different types of concussions that are more like, like they diagnose it more other places in, in the brain and neck, in the head and neck. And it's like that all can be affected by correcting the alignment of the neck because it, it has so much input into all those other sy systems, the eyes and the neck, the ears and the neck, the inner ear and the neck, the brain and the neck. Like it's, it's so interconnected that if you correct the neck, it helps all those systems work better. Yeah. So anyways, that was just something I wanted to touch and, on. And that brings up, a, a, it makes me think of a different point also of how how simple yet complicated this actually is. And uh, it's, it's something I've actually started to focus more on my patients as well. When they come in and they're like, hey, I have blah, 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 can you help? And I'm like, I don't know. However, mm -hmm. if what I correct and what I fix is the cause of your symptoms and problems, then it's going to help. So what, what I think about in this situation is, is a lot of these concussive patients probably have, I would say probably all of them have a concussion and a whiplash injury, right? That's kind of what we've been saying. So, so the idea is to find the cause of those problems and, and make sure everything is treated to, to, to heal to the maximum capacity. And the point of this research is, is to say, hey, there's a net component here we have to look at the neck also. And I would even go so far as anybody with a concussion should be checked anyway, because you could have underlying problems. I mean, how many times have you had a patient come in, you know, oh, I, you know, I, th these problems started five years ago. Oh, well, in your history, six years ago, you had an accident. Yeah, but I was fine. It's like, were you? What you started having problems a year after your accident. Is this just a coincidence? Like how many coincidences do we have to see before we start putting two and two together. And you said that at the very beginning of the episode, you said, you know, all of your patients have had some sort of trauma in the, in, in the past. And I mean, who hasn't, you know, like who hasn't? So. Anyway. Yeah. And I mean, I'm <clears throat> something that I, you know, have put together over the years is car accidents. Like dr driving on the road is probably one of the most dangerous things you can do. Uh, so, you know, car accidents are probably one of the most common ways whiplash and concussions occur. And that's even at low speeds. I mean, at high speeds, it's ridiculous what happens to the body. I mean, you talk 100 miles an hour, you, you've got you've got a lifelong uh, disability possibly if uh, you know if that patient isn't really taken well taken care of and at a young age. If they're older, that's that's going to be a sustained injury. Uh, but it's like <clears throat> you know, you just look at these these injury times and then when the symptoms start, you know, rollover car accidents. That's another one you know, chronic neurological diseases, rollover car accidents are so bad. And people, I mean, I have people that come in, they're like, yeah, I was ejected from a car five years ago. I got up, I walked away, I was fine. And I'm like, you were ejected from a vehicle <laughs> yeah. on the highway yeah. and yeah. you didn't like get yeah. under care somewhere. Yeah. Like, oh my God. Like it just, you know, these are things that we need more education. I mean, the dentistry has done a ton of work over the years to educate people on taking care of their teeth. This is another, another thing that really needs to be, uh, you know, educated. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, it just, it makes me think about, unfortunately, my own health Yeah. and my own accidents that I've had. Like health has been literally the entire focus of my life in my free time to feel better to not be in pain, 
to have better foot, you know what I mean? And finally, when I discovered upper cervical chiropractic, a year after being in chiropractic school, mm-hmm. I started to see things get better. But the point being is that how many times, almost every time, every patient that comes in that has some degree of degenerative changes in their spine, it is not a normal aging process. They have had injuries to their spine and they didn't have appropriate and enough conservative chiropractic care to fix or manage what happened to their spine. And it's, it still baffles me to this day that I continue to have patient after patient. And it's like, we start at step one. This is your spine. These are discs. These are, you know, because people, we, because we're not educated because it's not valued in this healthcare system right now. And it's absolutely sad because people are suffering. Mm-hmm. Th- hundred, how many hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions, millions in the world millions. are suffering because they don't have yeah. this proper care. So it's like, it's still crazy. And we've talked about this before that we go through, we go through life and looking at people and say, like nobody, still nobody knows what we know as far as the importance of the spine. And again, there are many reasons that could take maybe a couple of days to go over about why that is. But the sad story is that that's the fact. And the, like when, when your spine is injured, it needs to be taken care of. It needs to be checked throughout our entire lives. And this paper is a foundational piece in explaining why that is. Like this paper, <clears throat> you know, this, there's a chiropractor that's part of this paper, but he's not an upper cervical chiropractor. Howard Vernon is a very like mechanical, um, evidence-based, not that evidence-based is bad, but there's a lot of uh, kind of misunderstanding in that evidence-based world that you can only do what's in the literature. And we have to remember there's three prongs to that evidence-based care is patient uh, uh, expectations or what the patient wants, the clinical experience of the doctor, and then what's in the literature. And what you and I know is that those those clinical experiences that we have going back 125 years in chiropractic that we've been seeing these patterns over time and so anyways this is a foundational paper we need to look at this more it needs to be put out there in the profession more i mean a lot of chiropractors don't even know this paper exists and it is a upper cervical it's a foundational paper so I'm glad we're talking about it. What's the next point, Dr. Lee? So next point, uh, I mean, and I think you actually mentioned in one of our private conversations that this was done in 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, it's now six years later. So do you know of any other um, more literature coming out with PCS and its relation to the cervical spine? They talk about a lot of times mild traumatic brain injury. So if you look up MTBI, <clears throat> there's some there's like a, a literature review paper uh, that's got some good stuff in there. I forget the name of the title, but it's like review of the literature on MTBI and the cervical spine. Uh, that's a good one. There's a couple other ones, but uh, I mean, there's more and more all the time. But again, it's not coming from a vitalistic perspective. It's not looking at, you know, kind of this upper cervical perspective that we have where millimeters of misalignment can cause lifetimes of problems, right? And so that's that's kind of the difference. Uh, where, you know, we're trying to explain this in a way. It's like, I had a guy this morning, he came in, he's feeling the best he's felt in uh, 10 or 20 years. And he's been to 10 different chiropractors. I've seen him maybe 10 visits now, and I've adjusted him about three or four times in his cervical spine. And he's feeling the best he's felt in forever. But it's because we're being very specific, only adjusting when we need to, not when we don't. And, you know, it's just that really fine touch of an upper cervical chiropractor to correct the cervical spine, to make the brain and the body work better. So, yeah, I think that's a great, and that's a great point. And, you know, one of the things that a lot of, a lot of people coming in to the office here want to know is, is how are we different? And it's one of the hardest questions that I get, period, because I absolutely love my chiropractic brothers and sisters, and they absolutely change lives. But I've had several patients as well that have been to very, very good and experienced traditional chiropractors who have helped tons of people. But the way, but we have to differentiate it somehow. And, and it's, and I, and I always, I always say I'm, I'm walking on thin ice when I, whenever I answer these questions, because I don't want to put the traditional chiropractic down. 
but I have experienced absolutely unequivocally without a doubt that I have gotten results personally with my health, with upper cervical chiropractic care compared to the traditional chiropractic care. Now, maybe that's not everybody, but the point being is that it's not me, it's not you that are getting these better results and you're so great over these 10 different chiropractors. It's what are we doing with the upper neck? The upper neck is absolutely unique compared to the rest of the spine and it has to be looked at in such a way and it has to be adjusted and monitored and examined in such a way in order to get complete results. I'm, I'm not say I, ha, I actually have some of my patients that actually also go see a traditional chiropractor. Yep. I, I think we might differ on our, our opinions on, uh, on, on what that does possibly, but I have no problem with that because I know that at some times yeah. people need traditional chiropractic somewhere other than their upper cervical spine. But the key point in that, and I know we're getting a little bit away from the topic here, but it's important yeah. is that the key point is that the upper cervical spine is the foundation a lot of, you know, some chiropractors think the, the pelvis and that down there is the foundation and that's the most important, but we believe that the upper neck is the foundation that has to be treated very specifically and corrected. And then if there's anything else that's necessary that needs to be adjusted with traditional chiropractic or massage therapy or acupuncture, or anything else, it's fine, but it's the upper cervical spine that's absolutely critical that needs very, very precise attention. If I can just absolutely <clears throat> add a couple of things. So one, uh, yes, uh, you know, uh, a good correction to the upper cervical spine is very different. And it's not that we believe it. I mean, <clears throat> back in the day <clears throat> in 1930, when BJ Palmer developed uh, upper cervical along with a handful of other upper cervical chiropractors or chiropractors, they developed upper cervical, um, you know, th their science was leading them there. They were studying this. So again, it comes back to that clinical perspective, as well as patient results and patient expectations. Um, that is huge. And over, over the years, since 1930, a lot of medical research has backed us up. And a lot of the medical profession doesn't even know that literature, or doesn't even know that the upper cervical profession has existed that long, and that we've been doing it for this long. But there are a handful of reasons why an upper cervical chiropractic correction might be more foundational at certain times for people, that, that's a scientific fact because of how we're born, how we learn to walk. It's it, they're, they're gravitational forces on the neck and how it's made. It's made so differently. It requires a specific correction. So if you, it's like one of my old mentors used to say, and he was, he was a, uh, a general chiropractor, he used to say, a Manual manip manipulation to the cervical spine is like flying a Boeing 747 from one side of the sidewalk to the other. This is a general chiropractor. It is too much for the average person's cervical spine. Uh, and, and so you need specific gentle corrections in that upper neck that uh, really take into account the way the joints are made, the ligaments, tendons, and muscles that are there, and use 3D imaging to analyze and correct it and pre and post measure it because it's just different. The, the lumbar spine, the bones in your lumbar spine are almost as big as your fist, right? And so they're just different. They're bigger. There are more muscles attached up uh, down low that, that you know, can take more force and movement. Whereas up high, the top neck bone's two ounces. It's tiny. It needs specific corrections and it's right underneath the brain. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's not necessarily that every single patient is 100% going to need it as a foundational piece. Not everybody does, but that's because of, you know, maybe they haven't had too many traumas to their head and neck, you know, and, and they aren't so injured up there and maybe their lumbar spine is more injured. And that, that happens, that, that does happen sometimes. But neurologically speaking, the literature says, the literature says that correcting the cervical spine specifically the upper cervical spine has a lot more impact on the rest of the spine. And that's why we do this podcast. That's why we've been doing this podcast for a year and a half or almost two years, maybe like, I can't remember how long we've been doing it now, but you know, we've covered so many good papers on why the cervical upper cervical spine is so impactful to the rest of the body, the rest of the nervous system. I'm done. <laughs> awesome. No, that's good. That's super good. Um, 
Let's go over uh, the five cases. I just yeah. I did a I just did a summation of each one. I'm hoping that you know the that even that patients watching this. Maybe we should have done this in the beginning, but um, maybe the patients you know patients watching this that are you know that are suffering can get an idea about what they can you know what they can expect as far as from you know from their care. And this is just from you know from upper cervical care and I think a little bit of soft tissue. They had some different treatments I yeah. think Verity. in the paper. Yep. So yeah. Okay, so case number one, 25-year-old diagnosed with PCS, daily headaches, dizziness, noise sensitivity, alternating cold and hot sensations in the back of the head, um, doctor's palpation of certain muscles in the upper neck, in the upper neck, recreated the exact pain experienced by the patient. So, you know, and that's actually an interesting point is I, I do that all the time with with some of the just very generic orthopedic tests that I do with my patient. I push down on the top of their head and their dizziness gets worse. And it's like, do you think, do you think your spine is related to your dizziness? And it literally, it, it matches that it correlates right there. They're like, holy crap. Like, yeah, obviously like you're, you're pushing on my spine and it's, it's exacerbating my dizziness. Okay. Yeah. I, well, I guess obviously there's something, there's something connected there. Right. So three neck treatments and they were 80 and 80% 80 improved this 25 year old. Eight neck treatments, 100% recovered. <clears throat> Pretty cool. Yeah. Case number two, 59-year-old female, headaches, dizziness, anxiety. At three months of care, she was asymptomatic. Case number three, a 19-year-old male, headaches, dizziness, and, visual and to, problems. To, to reiterate, these, yeah. these people are getting spinal manipulative therapy, SMT, in their cervical spine. Right. It's one of the major components of them getting well. And again, it's not specific upper cervical care, you know, and so just to, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Just to make that clear for sure. Um, case number three, 19 year old male, headaches, dizziness, visual problems, fatigue, sensitivity to light, mental fog, concentration difficulties, 80% improvement after four treatments over 21 days. And again, spinal manipulative therapy and some ART, some soft tissue therapy. Case number four, 19 year old male, again, headaches, irritability, sleep disturbances, visual difficulties, concentration problems, neck pain, full resolution of symptoms after eight treatments, 47% reduction of symptoms after only one treatment. Case number five, 51 year old female, daily headaches, neck pain, three treatments over six weeks, complete resolution. You know, again, even if these patients aren't getting 100% better, I know a lot of these, you know, several of my patients may, you know, they, they come in and they say, I would be fine with 50% better. Yep. I would be fine with, you know, you know, two points on the, on the 10 some points. Because they've yeah. been stuck in swimming in one place for 10 years. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, one other thing this paper does talk about is uh, double impact syndrome. So uh if you study concussion, if you look at this, um, con post-concussion syndrome can hang around a lot of times if you have not worked on that concussion and gone back to play or gone back to doing what you normally do right after you got your concussion. Uh, and so what what will happen is again, you get hit again within like a week or two and your concussion hasn't resolved. The symptoms are still there. This is why it's really important to get checked. Did you play football in high school? You played yeah. football in high school. Yeah. Look, dude, I love my memories of Friday nights under the lights. You know, we had a warrior chant. We, we like, it was awesome. Those are some of the best memories I have from high school. But I, I there was a kid uh, and I'm not going to say his name. I, I mean, maybe he'll see one of my videos someday. And it's not even funny, man. Like this guy, he developed post-concussion syndrome and he got hit over and over again. And he kept playing and that he was our point guard in basketball and he was our, our quarterback in football. And he just played and kept playing and he'd take breaks and he'd come back in. And he, the last I knew of him, uh, he couldn't concentrate, he couldn't focus. You know, it was, he was really having a hard time with uh, communication and relationships and just, you know, personal interactions. And there's actually, actually there's more than one guy like that on my football team. And I had 20 kids on my team, you know, and there were at least two or three of them that had some serious post-concussion syndrome stuff. Um, and I did too, and I didn't even know it, but you know, then over the years, and I've had many concussions, not just those, 
I went over the handlebars, you know, one day, cracked a helmet in half, you know, and, and so it's like, this stuff adds up, you got to take care of it. If you don't take care of it, it gets worse and it impacts your entire life, it, you know, big Absolutely. Com communication, relationships, uh, you know, success in business, all these things, it's, it's your life. Uh, so, you know, getting and, you that know, upper effect is really important. The crazy thing is, is like, it, it, it is your life, but when these things happen to people and they're like, oh, it's all in your head, it's a psychological thing. Like, it's crazy. And they give you a pill. Yeah. But it's like, it's, you know, you think about whether it's from post-concussion syndrome or not, when these people come in with these headaches and these migraines and dizziness and these incapacitate, you know, incapacitating things that literally ruin people's lives right? It, it's not cancer. It's not, yeah. you know, like dying in a car. It's not these huge, huge traumas in these catastrophes that happen, but it's a, it's an insidious mm -hmm. catastrophe because it literally ruins people's lives. It yeah. ruins marriages. It ruins relationships and people lose their jobs. Like it's, it's crazy how this is out there. So this is a huge piece of the puzzle because there are too many people out there that don't know about this. I don't know. They go to the medical doctor, they're treated for concussion or they're given a drug and they're, it makes them drowsy or it makes them this. And they're not like their, their quality of life is just in the toilet. And this needs, this information needs to be disseminated and spread so that people understand that there is help out there. Yeah. So and it's a piece of the pie. It's a piece of the pie. Getting exactly. the neck corrected is a piece of the pie. I, I talked to you before this about vestibular vestibular therapy is one part. Vision therapy is another part. Neurofeedback is another great part. I told you on Tuesday, I saw my neurofeedback practitioner. I've been seeing her for two years and it has dramatically changed my ability to focus, communicate, word finding, um, you know, just all the pieces of cognition that, that, you know, all those things together, my, my optometrist, she's amazing. And she came and presented at our Blair conference back in 2017. Like, you know, it's just having these relationships with these, these providers, it's not one of them. It takes a village. Uh, you know, the neck is a big part of it and right. it needs to be looked at, but all and, these things can help. It, it is. And it, and that's the thing. And that's, that's enough. It's interesting. You bring up that's the piece of the puzzle. I was really kind of for years, I was kind of hooked on that, on that topic is it's the, it's the piece of the, the pie or the, it's a piece of the puzzle that nobody knows about. Mm -hmm. And when you go to uh, even, even medical doctors out there that focus on concussion, they know about the visual stuff. They know about even possibly the no feedback and that they know about these things, but the, the, the cervical spine is still not being talked about. And it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy and it's sad and it's frustrating that, mm. that this is out there that we can help people and, and people are still not, people are still not kind of getting. And there's hope and there's hope and there, there's lots of hope in getting good upper cervical chiropractic care. There's, there's lots of hope in all the, modalities that are out there you know people that have head injuries can get better that's i think that's the biggest message is this literature is out there we're getting the word out you get the word out listen to this podcast you know share this information dr leach will link the the paper in the, in the video here uh you know it, it's there is hope i mean i i was fairly affected by my post concussion uh, uh symptoms and I've seen tremendous results with just upper cervical care, diet, exercise, uh, neurofeedback, all the things I was telling you about. And, and there's hope. You can get better. You really can. The body can heal itself. That's what we're, we're you know, founded on in chiropractic. The body can heal itself. Absolutely. All right. So, again, you know, again, if you're a patient and you're watching this, then it, it, at least get your cervical spine analyzed by some sort of provider um ideally obviously we're biased but an upper cervical chiropractor we think would be um would be wise ideal. also ideal ideal. ideal um not best ideal <laughs> but uh, definitely get it definitely get it checked out um let me read i wanted to read the last paragraph of the conclusion here just because it kind of sums it sums everything up real real nice in conclusion Management of persistent PCS symptoms 
through ongoing brain rest, through ongoing brain rest is outdated and demonstrates limited evidence of effectiveness in these patients. Instead, the case the cases presented above, which we just went over, as well as previous literature in the area produce initial evidence that skilled manual therapy related assessment and rehabilitation of cervical spine dysfunction should be considered for chronic symptoms following concussion injuries. Now, to your point just a couple minutes ago, the initial couple weeks rest is obviously important, but mm. the ongoing recommendation of just continuing to rest weeks and months later that's yeah. there's no there's no well they used to tell people that it had you know bad con concussion symptoms to just go live in a dark room because th th people would not be able to go out of a dark room and they just be like well just stay in there because you don't want to overdo your your uh uh neurology but you know you, you got to get out there you got to move you got to push the limits a little bit and and that's another thing i don't know about you but i've coached a lot of people this is as much working with a post-concussion patient is as much of a like exercise in coaching of the lifestyle activities i mean these patients they want to get back out there they want to get back doing what they used to do and they'll burn out and there's batteries and you got to like keep in, in mind you don't want to burn all, all through all your batteries. You've got like a day battery, a week battery, and a month battery. I got that from a, a book called uh, uh, the, Ghost, the Ghost in My Brain. Check that book out. It's a great book. Uh, but uh, that's from Dr. Amy Przinsky. Look her up. She's amazing. But uh, uh, he talks about having these batteries and these, these patients, they'll burn through their batteries super quick because they're trying to like get back out there and do their life, but it's too much. So you got to slowly chunk off you know, some exercise, but not too much. And then pair it with, okay, now I'm going to take care of my kids for a little bit, but not too much. You know, I got to give them back to dad or, or give them back to mom or, you know, whatever. Um, so it's, it's, it's this constant exercise and learning how to push the limits, but not too far, just enough to, to build the, the, uh, the body up a little bit over time. Anyway, sorry to great. interrupt there, but no, it's great. That's important. Perfect. It's super important because people get they get frustrated, they get better, and then and then they hit the wall again, and they're like, "What the heck? What happened?" You got to think about it like that, and it's yeah. it's tough. It's tough. It takes time. It takes time, and unfortunately, it's a it's a it's something else that I've been actually focusing on with my patients recently as well. Is that you know, as as chiropractors, we love to think, "Oh, we just need to get to the cause, and the cause is the cure," right? It's like a lot of times, a lot of times, people have to manage. Yeah, these spine injuries, and it's something that they have to take care of for the rest of their lives. Yep. You know, some people come in, they get great results, and then they stop coming in, it comes back and they're like, Oh, that didn't work. It's like, no, 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 no. Like, yeah. you have a condition yeah. that needs to be managed. And it's, it's tough for people. People don't want to hear that people don't want to hear oh, you mean I have to get adjusted for the rest of my life. It's one of the stigmas in chiropractic. It's like, yeah, yeah, you do. Because yeah. you injured you your spine. You have to go to the gym. Yeah, you have to go to the gym. Do you have to eat your veggies for the rest of your like it's yeah, like it's a healthcare, it's a foundational healthcare thing. And if you never injure your spine, good luck with that, then you won't need a chiropractor. But the chances are that you probably did. Right. So and that's okay. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Any last thoughts about the paper? It. Let's I want to I want to thank the authors for doing such an amazing job on this paper. Yeah. And yeah. we encourage again to for people to actually <laughs> read this. Um, I'll link it, uh, I'll link, you know, I'll link it in the description below and we've never done this before, but I have a question of the day for the listeners. Uh, and I'm not sure if I'll have you answer it now or maybe later, but how many research studies has Dr. Evans read in his career? Do you think you actually know? No, I no. don't know. Do you think you have some sort of idea? Could you kind of oh, sit down right. and think that maybe, yeah. I mean, geez, dude, like, I don't know, thou I mean, thousands, like, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's definitely in the thousands. I wouldn't say that it's more than, you know, a few thousand, like, th there's not that much research, and I haven't had that much, I've only been in practice for 10 years, yeah. <laughs> you know, but I would say it's probably thousands, like, you know, I look at a new paper, at least, like, over, if I averaged it out over the course of my career, at least one new paper a week, you know, 52 weeks in a year, um, you know, times 10. So it's 500. But then yeah, I know least. I've done 
and I've yeah. done more than that. Yeah, there's like I've done do seven in a you and I have done what how many videos have you and I done? We've probably yeah. done 10 or 15 videos. Yeah. yeah. And that's just that's just scratching the yeah. surface yeah. of yeah. you know. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well what about you? That, uh, you know, it's not it's not that many. It's been it's been more in, in more recent years. Yeah. I would probably put mine around maybe half that half, half of what you just said, and maybe maybe even less. Um, yeah. And you know, sometimes I don't read the entire thing, you know, sometimes I'll skim it. But, yeah. um, but it's definitely something I'm obviously more interested in as time goes on. And, you know, you read one paper, and then the you've got citations for 27 That's... more. And you're like, Oh, it's like, a what is it the Hydra, you cut off yeah. one and seven come out. <laughs> it's, it's, a, like, it's a rabbit. It's a rabbit hole, man. Yeah. And, on, and on that, you know, just the last point there, I want to do I want to do more of these and I want to create a playlist and, you know, to, to get more of this research out and to really get the information out there for people. So they just have a plethora of information and resources to, to, to see and to, and to have for help. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, my friend. And uh, we'll see you next time. Awesome. Great work. Awesome. Thank you, sir. See ya. Okay, that's it for this episode. So what did you learn that fascinated you or surprised you about the research today? Join or start the conversation in the comments below. Hey, thanks so much for watching. To watch more of our research shows, click or tap the screen right there. To subscribe to the channel, click or tap the screen right there. Until next time, I'm Dr. Kevin Leach with the Upper Cervical Chiropractic Research Show, bringing awareness to conservative primary spine care, upper cervical chiropractic care, and traditional chiropractic. Until next time, take care and take care of your spine. It's the only one you'll ever have.